السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وی ول ناؤ بی اسٹارٹنگ دا مفتی محمد صادق پروگرام آئی وڈ ریکویسٹ صدر صاحب ٹو پلیز اے کمپنی حبیب شفیق صاحب آن دا اسٹیج السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ سو اٹ از آر ٹریڈیشن ٹو ریکگنائز دی ایلڈرز آف آر کمیونٹی دا جائنٹس ہو ہیو پیو دا وے فار آس اینڈ ون پرپز از ٹو پرزرو اینڈ ایکنالج آور ہسٹری ہاؤ ایور بریفلی وی کین ان دیز بریف سیشنز بیکاز دیر آر سو مینی ان ٹولڈ اسٹوریز دیٹ وی نیڈ ٹو ہیئر آئی ایم ہوپنگ حبیب صاحب ال شیئر اسٹوری of his time with Khulafa, particularly Khalifa Salis, and also that wonderful story about Dr. Abdul Salam. That's a teaser right there. And then another purpose for doing these programs that we, um, with the Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Award, is to remember that we have come a long way, and we want to show you how far we've come, <clears throat> both as a Jamaat and as a Majlis. Today we are recognizing two beloved elders of our community. First, respected Muhammad Bashir Sahib Marhoom, who passed away on May 28th, 2010, so not too long ago. And uh, I want to relate some of his uh, accomplishments, some of his life story with you briefly, and then we'll talk with Habib Sahib. <clears throat> Muhammad Bashir Sahib accepted Ahmadiyyat in 1971 in Milwaukee. He introduced his wife, Nusrat Jahan, to Ahmadiyyat and she signed Beth about three months after him. Milwaukee was their first Jamaat, but they have also been active members of Harrisburg, Philadelphia, and most recently, Phoenix. He was the proud and loving father of seven born Ahmadi children and grandfather to 13 grandchildren. And mashallah, all his family is actively serving the Jamaat in various capacity. He was diagnosed with multiple uh, myeloma, a cancer of the blood, on May 10th, and had started treatment, but returned to his Lord, his Creator, his beloved Creator, on May 28th. Bashir Sahib, Marhum, loved languages and had an aptitude for learning them easily. He could always be seen at Jalsa Salana speaking Urdu with the Pakistani brothers, Chinese with his Chinese brothers, Arabic with his Arab brothers, and so on. He loved all mankind and was overjoyed when in 2008, Hazur mentioned his family's multiracial and multicultural makeup as an example for Jamaat in joining of diverse backgrounds within the fold of Islam Ahmadiyyat. <clears throat> Muhammad Bashir Saab was an active, outgoing personality, making life, lasting and lifelong friends, both young and old, anywhere and wherever he went. He was known for his warm embraces, his friendliness, and his powerful handshake. Now this is towards the end when he was diagnosed and he was in severe pain. <clears throat> he made an effort to mask the pain and maintain a smile whenever he went to the doctor's office because he said he wanted to cheer up the other patients. The doctor's office sent a card on his passing and each person in the office had written a personal note. The medical assistant said that although he had only been coming there for a short time, he had quickly become the whole office's favorite patient. Muhammad Bashir Sahib put the motto of love for all, hatred for none into practice. He respected everyone regardless of faith or background. He would always be willing to help humanity and was especially sensitive to those in need and left a lasting impression on all. <clears throat> Brother Ashraf Islam remembers him as a model Ahmadi convert. He said that he embraced different cultures while keeping his own and rose above all the cultural arguments. He would be serving at a jalsa and seamlessly transitioning between greeting and entertaining members of different backgrounds while keeping a consistent warmth and brotherhood for all. And on the far side, we have a brief slideshow, uh, pictures collected by his son 
and sent to us uh, sharing those precious uh, images with us. <clears throat> Muhammad Bashir Sahib had a selfless nature and lived his life in service to others. When he performed Hajj in 2010, there was an elderly wheelchair-bound lady in his tour group that had come alone. He eagerly volunteered to watch out for her and she was able to complete her Hajj with the effort and help of both him and his wife. On one occasion, when living in Milwaukee, there was a lady who collapsed in a store and he immediately ju jumped into action and performed resuscitation and CPR to save the woman's life, the woman's life before the paramedics arrived. Another example, a young boy on a bicycle was hit by a motorist and his leg was badly injured. Bashir Saab wrapped the boy's leg in a tourniquet made from his own shirt and stayed with the boy until help, help arrived. <clears throat> Sadha Saab also narrated, uh, some of these memories were shared on the Brotherhood group, and Sadha Saab narrated his personal um, remembrance of Bashir Sahab back in the day when Sadha Saab was serving as Muhtamim Tablir, and he had to get an order for the real revolution shirts made. Sadha Saab says that the order was very large, 700 shirts or so. It was generous of him to print them for cost, but then he added, it's for Allah's sake. Even if you don't pay me anything, that's okay too. Just one example of his generosity. <clears throat> Many young people described him as their favorite uncle. Samia Mohamed Latif Sahiba writes about her niece. Nadia loved your father very much. We would ask her to name her favorite uncles and Muhammad Bashir was first. Her maternal uncle was second. Muhammad Bashir Sahib treated women with respect and compassion and advocated for their rights. Sister Rashida Ahmed of Philadelphia writes, I remember having my storage in another state and how he helped me move and unload my heavy furniture, some of which could not fit into the elevator. He carried the sofa up four flights of stairs and then carried it back down because it was too big to fit through the door, all, um, all the while being cheerful and kind. And then she says, I always try to remember him in my prayers because I will never forget his selfless act of kindness when I needed assistance so badly. <clears throat> he was a simple man and preferred to use the word brother rather than formal titles such as sahib. Imam Abdullah Dibba sahib writes that I know him as a very humble and dedicated gentleman. He had a smiling face wherever I saw him and he always had words of encouragement. He was a devoted member of Jamaat and became a Musi before his death. May Allah bless him and envelop him in his mercy. I will now ask Habib, uh, since uh, his family, his sons, uh, could not be here uh, at the Ishtama, uh, respectfully asking Habib Shafiq Sahib to accept uh, this uh, humble gesture on the Majlis's part to accept this. So now we will uh, talk to Habib Sahib, and I want this to be a conversation style. I will ask a question, uh, more like an interview, and Habib Sahib, if you could please indulge us with memories, with your precious memories, and hopefully um, we won't be shedding tears uh, in some of those stories. <clears throat> so let's start with your background first, Habib Sahib. Uh, can you tell us about your parents? Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah barakatuhu. Saru Saab, my dear brothers in Qadam al For the life of me, I, I don't know why you selected me for this, but I hope that my words will be of some refreshing guidance in some way for you. And I've started off emotional, so 
Naveed Malik won't recruit me for his comedy fiasco next year if I come to this. So that said, sir, what was your question? Just tell us a little bit about, about your parents. My father was born David Mark Lampkin Taylor. And he was born in Dayton, Ohio. My mother, her name was Willa Pearl Shafiq. She was born in Tennessee. And my father came from a very progressive, conservative, Negro family that was staunched Republican in the stripes of Frederick Douglass and Dwight D. Eisenhower at a time when the Republican Party was truly a friend of people of color. Mm. And this was in Dayton, Ohio. And, and I am the oldest of seven sons. Mashallah. How did your father come to accept Ahmadiyyat? And how, what were the circumstances? How did his family take to that? My father used to walk down a street in West Dayton, Randolph Street. He saw these people with funny caps and doing some different things out in the yard. And he would throw rocks at them and run. So once, I, I don't know why he, he didn't, but he heard the azan, I think he said. But he also heard something in a film that he had saw. And he told me it was, a, it was a, one of those original Bollywood films. Uh, and the person was saying, ums for the love of Allah, ums for the love of Allah in this film. So he heard this Allahu Akbar, he heard this azan, and he was intrigued and he went in. He was 13 at the time. He went in and he met with them, and it was when he was 16, when he developed a relationship with them and became very interested in Islam and Ahmadiyya. There were three people, three men who were instrumental in that. One, his name was Habib, one, his name was Muhammad, the other brother, his name was Shafiq. So my father went from Mark David Lampkin Taylor to Habib Muhammad, Shafiq, without his mother's permission, my grandmother, and she scolded him and said, if you don't renounce this, you're out of the house, and my father did not. And so in 1947, he became a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Dayton, Ohio. MashaAllah. And then, <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit about your early years, your education, your schooling, and then later on your professional life before we move on? Yes. I, I was born Habib Muhammad Shafiq Jr. So like those of you who were born Ahmadi, I was born with, uh, with Ahmadi on a silver platter. And in, at that particular time, I remember being an Ahmadi in terms of my name. I, I remember being a Muslim by name. And this was essentially because my father had disconnected himself with the Jamaat over a dispute that he had with the administration. And he disconnected us from the mosque. So imagine you had the cojones to accept Ahmadiyyat at 16. And now you're older and you have seven sons and you disconnect them from the Jamaat. And in a, a short period of time, we went from having a relationship with the members of the Dayton Mosque to nothing. Mm. So imagine growing up in West Dayton around African Americans my first encounter with bigotry did not come from white people. It came from black Baptist people. So I had this funny name. I wore this funny cap. My father was a Republican. He always had these Republican signs in the yard. So that's why I became a master at verbal jujitsu. I had to defend myself, not against white people who were prejudiced. They were easy. I had to defend myself against the people who looked like me. So I grew up 
detached from a Jamaat with a name, and you, re you recall the film Four Days Without a Shepherd. I probably went maybe 15 years without a Jamaat or without going to the mosque. And then after that, those, that distant time? After that, like many of these um, Silver Spoon second generation Ahmadis, I took my Ahmadiyyat for granted. I was in college and for the life of me, I had a 1A rating and at the time the Vietnam War was raging. And for the life of me, I don't know why I never got drafted, I had a 1A. And that means that any, when you're 18, you had to go and apply for the draft. And they were, they were drafting African Americans left and right uh, for the Vietnam War. I was never called. So my buddy, he went off to uh, do some things in California. I told him no. And, and on a dare, on a dare, I told him that, uh, I wanted to, to rethink things about he and I, our relationship. I had stir, start flirting around with the devil weed marijuana. So David said to me, Habib, you can't quit like I can't quit. I said, of course I can. Nothing has a hold to me like that. So on a dare, I stopped smoking marijuana at 18. I would smoke every day. On this dare, it went to the next day. And maybe this is a little sensitive and more than what you wanted, sir. But we're in Colorado, and I'm going to keep it real. So David said, man, it's been a week. And then I went on again and again and again. He said, come on, let's go to California, do our co-op. I said, no, I'm going home to Dayton. I took a co-op job in... Uh, uh, social services where my career took me and I know I'm being long-winded here Mr. Moderator but the long and short of it I took a co-op job and I was working in the basement at a social service center and I heard this brilliant person speaking about Islam and 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 the black community his name was Muzaffar Ahmed Zafar of Dayton Ohio I went upstairs introduced myself to him I said sir I'm a Muslim my name is Habib Shafiq, Jr. So yes, I think I know your father. Why haven't I seen you at the mosque? Well, you see, sir, this is a long story. I went into this crazy diatribe that my father gave me why he justified taking his eight sons away from the Jamaat. So I gave him the regular Shafiq line, and he didn't buy it, and he looked at me very sweetly, he said, Oh, that's fine, Brother Habib, but what does that have to do with your relationship with Allah? He said, we have Juma at 1.15 on Friday. You know where the mosque is. I'm going to see you, right? I'm going to see you, right? I said, yes, sir. I came. I was 18. I reattached, and I'm still here. MashaAllah. From that day to this one, I've not smoked another marijuana joint, and I was 18, and I stopped on a dare, and that dare brought me back to where I was supposed to be. So all you second generation, third generation, all you parents who think that you've given your children Islam on a silver platter, Brother Naveed, I was living at a time when there was only two television stations. And at the end, at 11 o'clock, they would say, it's 11 o'clock, America. Do you know where your children are? And we were all in the house, and then there was a Star Spangled Banner. Now, it's 11 o'clock, and you're at home, but you're on the internet, and your parents don't know where you are. So... In short, because you were born Ahmadi, and parents, because you think that your children are born Ahmadi, does not mean that they will not and cannot 
flirt with other things, especially, especially if you gamble with your relationship with the Jamaat. You're putting them in peril. So now you're 18. Yes. You're reattached. Yes. But your trip to Rabwa, Qadian, your meetings with Khulafa are a little bit away. Yes. My Yet, first, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there two weeks, and now there comes this thing called the USA Convention. It wasn't called Jalsa Salana. Mm -hmm. And it was in Lake Forest, Illinois. So I said, okay, I'm going to go. But in the meantime, my father heard that I reconnected with his enemies at 637 Randolph Street, which happened to be the address of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So he put the word out to all of my brothers that Habib is no longer my son. He has embraced my and our enemies. He is taboo. So I went to the Jalsa in Lake Forest, and I met all these amazing, fired up, young, energetic people in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And I, I, I mean, I, it was something deep in my DNA because I was born in Ahmadiyya that resonated. And I just, I just uh, fell in love. And then we got this missionary named Mia Muhammad Ibrahim. And then Mia Muhammad Ibrahim, he said to Brother Muzaffar, you need to go to take a trip to Rabwa. You have all these questions about Qadam al -Amadir. And that's a whole nother separate, that's a fireside chat, but the long and story short was Qadam al -Amadir, prior to our connection with Khalafid, we were becoming a nationalistic paramilitary group. Many of us, my, my, my closet undercover was not just, was not marijuana, I flirted with that. I was a die hard in the wool Black Panther. And I felt the Black Panther Party had the solution for the United States. So I would sneak my Black Panther outfit outside and I would put it on and go to these various meetings. And the long and short of it, brothers, is that Majlis Qadam al Ahmadiyyad came initially centered around a lot of early converts who had a strong militaristic, I mean nationalistic bent. Our beloved brother Mazafar, he came from the New Republic of Africa. Haji Aminullah was a colonel in the New Republic of Africa. And I can go on and on and on and on and on. And now we have accepted Islam, and now I'm two years here, back reconnected with where I needed to be. And we see that we have a new white man among us who wants to mistreat us and, and treat us in a way in which we have fought for 400 years to resist. And this new white man was called a Pakistani missionary. So Brother Mazafar was on his way to Rabwa to go and meet somebody named Khalifa Nasir Ahmed and to talk to this Khalifa and to tell him what our situation is and to demand from this Khalifa that if we don't get some straightening out, not only are you gonna lose us, we're gonna resist. Brother Mazafar went in 1971, 1972. I was one of those individuals to help drive him to New York. He came back. We met him in New York. He's got the answer for us. Are we, going to dis, are we going to do the same thing the southern states did in the United States? Are we going to detach as a modulus, an organization, and as a group from this and, and do our own thing, start our own thing? So Brother Mazafa was going to come back and give us the marching orders. He got up at the podium in New York and was crying like a little baby. What's, what, what's the matter? He said, I met our Khalifa, and I was going to tell him everything that you sent me there to tell him. And he walked out, and I saw nothing but pure light, and my heart danced. And we all now have to go back 
And you have to get in touch and get this relationship with something called Kalafati Ahmadiyyad. President Saab, what are you talking about? No, we didn't use that word Saab. What are you talking about? He said, I went to Rabwa, I went to Qadiyam, and the people that I saw there are not like the people that you will see and meet here. And I'm charging all of you, as your leader, make a plan to go. I dropped out of college, took a job mopping floors at a hospital. It was $534 a PIA. And at the deadline, I had $534 to go and see why Brother Muzaffar was doing all this crying and who this Khalifa really was. And boy, did I find out who the Khalifa really was. And as you're talking, I want to remind the audience that many of the pictures you're seeing running on the slideshow are from Habib Saab that he shared with us from that trip in 1973 and some that are beyond that. Uh, in 1973, I believe you went to both Rabwa and Qadiyan. In those days, we went to Rabwa and Qadiyan. I went five consecutive times. In our first meeting when Hazrat Khalifa to Masih Salas, we were asking him all of these ridiculous things about this and that, that and this, and why do uh, Pakistanis treat us this way? Why does this, why? And he listened, and he answered all of our questions. We would have four or five malikats with Khalifa to Masih Salas every day during Jalsa. One time we were sitting in his living room in Kasra Khalafit, fire, wonderful fire was going. And he said to us, I have spoiled you chaps. He called us chaps mm -hmm. out of affection. He said, I have spoiled you chaps. A day is coming. See, you meet me three, four, five times. As a matter of fact, I want you to come back, meet me at the farm. I'm gonna show you where I've got these worms from Germany and I put it in this soil where nothing can grow and now I'm growing corn. I want you to come out there and I got a dish called samosa that I'm gonna make for you. It's my family. But I've spoiled you chaps. You see me four or five times a day. He said, and I'll never forget it, a time is coming when you're gonna see your Khalifa like this. Hmm. And the first time Khalifa Tumasi Kamas came to the USA, you know what they asked her? If you've seen Hazur in the last year, forget it, don't ask for a Malikat, you're not getting it. So he said, hold your questions. I'm gonna send you somebody. It's okay. Here, answer your questions, don't worry, but don't forget, I, I wanna show you this farm. That night, and I had a cheap tape recorder, I was sitting downstairs waiting for our guest. I saw this guy ride in. He had on an archkin, uh, 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 the, the front, uh, the Jenna cap strings. And he came in just like a cowboy. It was so cool. He was riding the bike, and he didn't get off. He got off the bike as the, as the bike was rolling, and the bike just almost parked itself. He walked right on in. I said, man, that's what I'm talking about. This cat is cool, right? So I introduce myself, Salaam Alaikum. My name is Habib Shafiq. I'm the vice president of the American Kafla, and everybody's coming down, but I had to, wanted to get the tape recorded and get everything set up and get your name and everything. And uh, what is your name, sir? He said, my name is uh, Tahir Ahmed. I said, Tahir Ahmed, yes, sir. What is your position with the Jamaat? He said, it's the same as yours. I said, this, this, this poor fellow, he maybe doesn't understand my, my accent. <laughs> and in an American, ugly American condescending way, no, sir. I mean, your, your position with the Jamaat. He looked at me and he said, my position? is the same as yours. There's only one position in Jamal Ahmadiyya. And he pointed in the direction of Kasra Khalafat. And he said, that is our beloved Imam. I'm Mirza Tahir Ahmed, and I'm here to answer any questions, if I can. 
that you might have. And boy, he would work all day doing Jalsa, come in and answer our question to the last man. And I fell in love with him right away. I began, I began to write him letters. And developed a relationship, and everybody has stories about Khalifa Rabi. I snuck away, and before we left, I snuck away to, to see him. He said, I was just thinking about you, Habib. I said, what were you thinking? He said, I wonder, what, kind of, what would you like from this dusty place? What kind of gift would you like? And I said, you've been keeping secrets from me. What secret am I keeping from you? I said, I heard that you were the only person left in the Promised Messiah's family, in, Klifasa, in the family, that kept the art, Klifasani's art of making perfume alive. He said, yes, that's true. How did you, who told you this? I said, no, 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 no. You didn't tell me this. I asked you everything. He said, okay. I said, that's what I want. He said, that's no problem. I love to make it for you. When are you leaving? I said, tomorrow. The long story short, he said, that's too short. I said, you asked me what I wanted. <laughs> he said, okay, but it won't be my best. Long story short, he made me this wonderful cologne that he made with his own hands. So the long story short is we began to make these series of trips to Rabwa. And these pictures that you'll see of our first outdoor Ijtima was prior to us having this relationship with Khalafid. You can't imagine doing this and not having a relationship with Khalafid. We were doing these things and we didn't have this relationship. This began to generate our relationship with Khalafid and from there it just bloomed and blossomed exponentially. I want to know more, uh, Sada Sahib wanted me to definitely ask you about this incident at, that, at one of the jalsas in those trips where Khalifat al-Masih Salis pointed. Yes. Why yes. don't you take the story forward? So <clears throat> in those days, there was no technology. And we, we would be clustered in, 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 in a group of five. And one of the cushy jobs that Qadam could have, Qadam al Ahmadiyya Rabwa could have, was to be your translator. That means they go with you with everything, they eat, they ride, um, they hang out with you as Americans, they loved it, right? So their job is this, we're sitting around like this, and the Kadam person would stand up, he would listen to what Khalifa Salas would say, and he would come back down, and he would tell us what was going on. So this was our second trip there, and I was on the stage, and I also remember our, our, our beloved Yusuf Latif, he was there on this one as well. We were in the same group and I was it with him and Brother Muzaffar and maybe two other brothers. So our translator was our brother Saeed Munawar there in Washington DC who translates our books. He was our Kadam uh, uh, translator. So this is our second trip to Rabwa. Now Rabwa now is a closed city, which means that the government is not taken over, we've been declared non-Muslim. And you can see the difference in the city. We're on stage, and Khalifa Salas is talking, and Brother Manawa would stand up, and he would come back down and give us some translation. He'd go back up and give us some translation. He went up third or fourth time, and he just kept standing there. And we knew we had a sense we were losing the context because he was mesmerized, and Khalifa Salas was just talking sweetly. Well, Brother Muzaffar now was very agitated, and he said, Manawar Saab, please, we're losing too much. He said, Brother Muzaffar, I'm coming. Please, please, I'm coming. This is just, he said, no, we're losing too much. He said, okay, okay. Before he could come back down in the huddle and tell us, Hazur is standing, it would be like, this way, and it was on his, we, 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 Hazur was like this, speaking to the Jalsagar. And he was speaking in Urdu, he's speaking in Urdu, and he takes off his glasses, 
And he points in our direction. And he says, stand up, stand up. Pointing to us on the stage of the foreign delegates. We stood up not knowing why we were standing. And of those of you who don't have never seen the crowds in Rabwa for Jalsa, they're sitting on hay, rice straw, no comfort, no air conditioning, not moving. This ga erupted with takbirs like I have never heard to this day, like you've never heard at any soccer match, nowhere. And then we ask, what did Hazur say? What did we miss? So Manawa Saab told us. He said, do you remember when we were coming in a train station and there's this long concrete brick wall and the soldiers have been ordered to go to that brick wall and wash off this prophecy that I shall give you a large, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. They had the responsibility from the government to wash it off now because this is now no longer an Ahmadi city. So they were washing it off. So Khalifa Salas was speaking to them very sweetly and very kindly. He was talking to these soldiers that you're doing your duty, you're doing this. And he said to them, my dear soldiers, you've taken an oath to uphold the country, and you're doing your duty. You can wash off these words. You can remove the brick wall. You can even remove the dirt that is supporting the brick wall. But what are you going to do with these individuals who are the fulfillment of this prophecy that I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. What are you going to do with them? And this is when that gar erupted and we begin to just weep. And it was in that moment that that's when I became an Ahmadi. At the end of this session, let's say that my shoes are at the door. I'm supposed to leave the, supposed to leave the marquee set. I'm supposed to leave this, walk there, get my shoes, we either walk or get in the car and go back to the guest house. So it takes me li literally 15 seconds to get to my shoes. By the time I got to my shoes, it was two hours later. Why? And, and during the talk beers, Khalifa Salas let him go on. It looked like it went on for the longest possible time. It took me two hours to get to my shoes. Why? I had a line of individuals, other people from around the world, and they were hugging us and crying. So I think now I know why I'm here talking to you and maybe receiving some humble award, because those people there prayed. They prayed for us, prayed for me. And in that moment, in that moment, I became a member, a full member and I knew what this meant. So then, this is you and a group of small people yes. having established this bond with yes. Khilafat. Yes. But there's a whole bunch of people back home in the United States who have not yet met Hazrat Khalifa al Masih. Yes. 1976 comes around. Yes. And Khalifa Salis comes here. Yes. Tell us some of those memories. In 1976, I had just gotten married. I was a new father. Gosh. There was a lot of excitement in America because it was the bicentennial, America's 200th birthday. So America was celebrating all year. It was a huge, positive uplift in the United States. Khalifa Salis came to Dayton. And this was my first assignment on his security detail. And in this particular, maybe two weeks prior to Khalifa Salah's coming, we had President Jimmy Carter, he visited Aiden. And he also stayed at the Biltmore Hotel 
and we had reserved a presidential suite for our beloved Khalifa Salas who came. And in those days, we had the run of the city. Imagine these ragtag African American members of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, the greatest lover of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We had a Cadillac with red carpet pulled right up into the jet tarmac as our Khalifa walked off. We had this, the, 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 the mayor giving him the key to the city, etc. But what we remember most is his message as he went. And as America was in this upbeat frenzy about the bicentennial, Khalifa Salis was talking to them about where the world and these powers were headed. And it is almost frightening again to hear our present Khalifa t saying the same things, but essentially, essentially, Khalifa Salis coming to the United States, now Khalafat i Ahmadiyyad was no longer this elusive concept, this hypothetical kind of ideal that we strive for. We had this relationship with the Khalifa of the time, Allah's vicegerent, who is the Khalifa of the Messiah, who is the servant of the Holy Prophet. So we now have a connection with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a result of this relationship with Khalafat. You have no idea what a powerful, what a powerful idea that that was and it now was a reality. It was no longer an idea. It was no longer an, a goal or a concept. And it was absolutely uh, incredible for us. And we have been striving ever since that time. But it was in 1976. And my Kadam security duty uh, would change over the years. But my very first one, uh, Brother Mazafar entrusted me with Hazur's residence. And so I was, uh, any of you, any of you had security with Hazur at the residence? you know that that is not an easy one. And I remember when he came up and went into the room the first time, I saw them get off the elevator, so I had my partner to open the door. I went in and swept, checked the room, everything again, and Hazur, he stood there. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, safe to go in now? <laughs> I said, yes sir, it's safe. And he went in. And I can't tell you that it, Khalafat, you, 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 you don't, un, you couldn't, and I wouldn't want you to understand what it's like not having a relationship with Khalafat. You don't know anything else. But for us, we didn't have a relationship with Khalafat Ahmadiyyad, and now we have it. So that was my first one on, in, 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 in the US. And then you were blessed to do security with Khulafa. So take us forward a few years and tell us uh, your, some memories with Khalifa Rabe after he became Khalifa, since you had already met him, as you told us, in Pakistan. Just to speak generally, because our security protocols are very serious, and we live in more dangerous times now. We were trained in Rabwa. A group of us were trained in Rabwa by our beloved Colonel Hyatt, may Allah be pleased with him. And we were also trained by Khalifa Tumasi the fourth, before he was the Khalifa. And each one of our Khalifas are just, I can tell you the best about them in two ways, their beards and their walk. Khalifa Salas had the most magnificent beard you can imagine. Look at these pictures and look at his beard, my gosh. Khalifa Salas walked with a cane, but he didn't need a cane. And Khalifa Salas was a jokester. So when I had point, point detail with him, which means that I was either in the point or on the side of a diamond formation, he would walk real fast and he would stop. 
and the missionaries will be blindly following him and they would be bumping into each other. So we first thought that this was just some prank, I mean some thing, but Khalifa Salas was doing this on purpose to show them how mindless they were just following him without any mindfulness of what they were doing. And he did this a couple of two or three times. And he had a very beautiful walk and he had a cane and I don't know why. Now Khalifa Rabi, on a, it was a whole nother level. May Allah be pleased with him. Khalifa Rabi was a power walker. And I always liked, and I guess I didn't have a choice, but Brother Muzaffar took me from regional kind of Qadam al and he assigned me as his national second in command of, of security. And Khalifa Rabi was a walker, a power walker. Khalifa Rabi, on his second stride walking, he would be in full, maybe three strides. He would take the initial one, second one, and he was on his pace. And he liked to walk in the mornings. And what I can tell you is this that their beards and their walk, I always found when my feet got tired and I was standing and I had been doing that duty. And brothers, what you don't understand is that uh, we at that time were a bunch of ragtag African-American Ahmadis who just barely had this new connection with Khalafid. And many of us were riding around Washington, D.C., armed in the service of our Khalifa. Now, there's a law called the Sullivan Act. And if you're caught with a firearm in Washington, D.C., they will put you under the jail forever. We did what we had to do for Khalifa di Ahmadiyyat, and we didn't abuse that. And Allah protected us and he shielded us to as such times as we've been able to now proliferate to a more sophisticated security detail. So the long and short of it is, Khalifa Rabi kept his beard black until his wife died. Then after his wife died, he just let it stay white. And Khalifa Rabi, when he came to America, he was absolutely uh, very indulgent. He liked gadgets, and he liked Pizza Hut, and he liked the sharper image, and he liked long morning walks, and he will walk you into the ground, and he didn't want you to salam him, he didn't want you to talk to him. He was in a whole nother space during that morning walk. and. The prankster part of Khalifa Rabi was he liked to drive fast. He didn't drive, he wanted you to drive him fast. <laughs> Real fast, in Washington DC, being a Negro with a gun. <laughs> and Allah kept us protected. And I'm here this day without a felony charge and the Statue of Limitations have passed. <laughs> and then I had the pleasure of doing a security, one security, I did two with Khalifa, Khalifa Rabi. And uh, Khalifa Rabi is a very high energy person, all our Khalifas are, but Khalifa Rabi is, um, his people engaging uh, thing was uh, a lot more extraordinary. So after his wife died, his beard stayed white and he could walk you under the ground. He stopped playing squash because he got hurt and people were writing and telling him that he, you know, he should stop doing that. He was a manly man. Khalifa Rabi was a manly man. He was a sportsman. He was no joke. He was a manly man. I'll share one, one incident. Khalifa Rabi had begun, before he came to America, we were in a hotel in Washington, D.C., the same hotel that Mr. Reagan was attempted assassination. We didn't know, our detail didn't know 
that Khalif Arabi had gotten a couple of dreams that an attempt was going to take place on him in America. And a couple other Jamaat members wrote him similar to be vigilant or something like that. He didn't say anything to us. We were in the Hilton, the same Hilton where Mr. Reagan got hit outside. One of the first and last cars you'll see, the only time you'll see a stretch limousine with a Khalifa, the first and last time was that particular occasion. And Khalifa Rabi did not like stretch limousines because they, they didn't go fast. So our in charges wanted a stretch limo for Hazur. So Lebec, we did a stretch limo. So the long and short of it, we were in the hotel. And to try to be as discreet as I can, Brother Muzaffar, our in charge, came to us. And there were some characters there, and he felt their rhythm was wrong. And so he put us on extreme high alert. So much so, he went up to Khalifa Rabi. Khalifa Rabi was getting ready to speak packed the Hilton, Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle, that Hilton. He whispered something. He whispered to Khalifa Rabi. Khalifa Rabi looked at Brother Muzaffar. Brother Muzaffar said, Hazur, we, we need to get you out of here. Khalifa Rabi looked at him, he said, Muzaffar, I am not afraid. He said, Hazur, I know. But sir, please, we need to get you out of here. Hazur got up. We extracted him with one of our pre-planned exit, escape things. It was in the back of the alley. This limo was parked. There was this much room on each side alley. And our driver, who was Zahir Ahmed, Imam Ahmed's son, was the driver. We put Hazur in the limo, and we get Hazur out of there. Hazur looked at our in charge. And he saw who they were, and he did not want to leave. And that's all I should say about that. We managed to get him out. We went, took him to our secure site on Leroy Place. And that's when Hazur began to tell us about his dream. And he began to accost the person who invited these characters in the first place. So as you see, we're having all these different things with the Caliphate. But the important things I'm not talking about, and that is going to Rabwa and Qadian. And when we would go there, we would get immersed with love, true spirit of love and Ahmadiyyad. And so when we came back, it didn't matter to us anymore how Pakistanis, we no longer had this leftover inferiority context, complex about you speaking whatever neighborhood language you speak. We began to get inundated with love. And in that love, we grasped hold of something called Khalafati Ahmadiyyad. And we did not want to let it go, and we held, and we're still holding. So those of you, Qadam, who will be serving this October, inshallah, we have prayed for you. 
We have paved the way for you. You have it much easier. You have more gadgets. You have more toys. Hmm. You have faster cars. You have cell phones. But more importantly, it won't mean jack if you don't have taqwa. See, these few little ragtag people that you see us around with, it wasn't us. We don't know what those individuals saw with us. Allah anointed us because we love this club. We, we were now in love. This was our bride and nothing was going to happen to him. Not on our watch. And we were willing to go to jail, to go to hell, to do anything. So when you sign up for that duty, the glamour stuff, walking with the Khalifa, that's bogus. There's nothing glamorous about that. You ready to take the bullet? Are you? Really? With your, with your cell phone in one hand? Be ready. Hazur is coming, be ready. So the long and short of it, brothers, with that, is that you are going to be asked to do some things and this modulus, this modulus is ready, more than ready, and in very, very capable leadership and hands. But without taqwa, without those prayers, whatever toy you have, whatever training you have, whatever, how many black belts you have, Dr. Saab, who was on our team, it won't mean nothing if Allah is not with you and to utilize that with you as a force to help. Now for those of you who are still in La La Land and in Disney World who think that the Khalifa, we don't need this, that Allah's got him, what happened to the first four Khalifas in Islam? How did they die? Anybody know the answer? How would they die? How did they get killed? Would we call them assassinations? They were martyrs, but what would we call them today? Assassinations. So do not think that it cannot happen. Think only that when you take that pledge the next time, whatever your duty is, if it is to check his room, to shine his shoes, or to drive that BMW, or some other duty, it doesn't matter. Do it in light of that pledge and mean it. And Allah's got you for the rest. Don't worry about nothing else. He's got you. And we are living proof of that. None of us ever got pinched by one police at all. And we were doing some illegal stuff for our Khalifa. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, I think those are good words to leave our khudam with. I know you have more stories to tell. I would highly encourage our khudam, and I think I can see your, uh, you move to learn more. So Habib Sahib is still here for some time. Approach him, introduce yourself, get some more stories out of him, and we will have to close this ceremony now in the interest of time. If Sada Sahib, if you could please this uh, Humble gesture from Majlis to recognize Habib Sahib. Nare Takbeer! Nare Takbeer! Islam e Ahmadiyya! Zindabad! Khilafat e Ahmadiyya! Zindabad! Mirza Ghulam e Madki! Jai! Ghulam e Madki! Jai! Nare Takbeer! Hadrat Khalifatul Masih al Khamis! Zindabad! Majlis Khudam al Ahmadiyya USA! Zindabad! Nare Takbeer! Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa. Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa. Salaam alaikum. 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 Salaam al
please pray for the continued progress of Jamati Ahmadiyyad in this modulus particular. We used to say back in our day that Qadam al we were the backbone of the movement. And there's some really strong and talented backbones here. You're gonna be charged with some extraordinary things over the next years as a modulus. Please pray that in, how many of you are in your 20s? Raise your hand real quick, please, 20s. Okay, you're probably going to be at the 100th. I probably won't be able to make it, but begin now to pray for that 100. Begin to pray that we, as a modulus, that we can represent truly the spirit of this. So keep all of us and our beloved Hazur in your prayers and allow Taqwa and your pledge to really permeate every fiber of your being. Please join me in silent prayer. Allahumma amin. <laughs>